Here's a question for you. What happens when the population outstrips productivity? When there isn't enough food to go around? Well, we know what happens because it's happened before in various parts of the world. Paul Ehrlich, in his book, The Population Bomb, wrote, The battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s, the world will undergo famines. Hundreds of millions of people are going to starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. And a newsletter I received from the Environmental Fund quotes William Malloy, professor of anthropology at the University of Wyoming, who says the specter of overpopulation is once again threatening the people of the remote Pacific Island, Easter Island. Back in the late 17th century, when the island's population outstripped its productivity, the devastation of war interrupted food production. The established religious aristocracy lost its essentially magical control, and the people degenerated into mutually hostile bands controlled by war leaders. The hitherto efficient economic equilibrium disintegrated. Crops were burned and farmers prevented from cultivating in safety. Cannibalism now became a practical activity, and people were hunted for food. Professor Malloy says what happens on Easter Island in the 17th century may be about to happen again. Since 1877, the island's population has been increasing at the annual rate of 5%. History will likely repeat itself. An anthropologist concludes the only difference being that this time, in line with Ehrlich's prediction, the fate of the Easter Islanders may be indistinguishably merged in a worldwide population explosion. Now, I don't go around the country preaching the possibility of disastrous effects of overpopulation. That's not my subject. But in talking to a group not long ago, I got on the subject and hit on what I thought was a pretty good illustration of what overpopulation can mean. I said the 200 of us in this room tonight are quite comfortable and at ease with one another. We've just enjoyed a good meal. Now we're relaxed and comfortable. But let's say we started adding new people to the room. For a while, everything would be all right. But soon, it would begin to get crowded and less comfortable. Finally, if new people kept being added, the crowding would become intense and uncomfortable in the extreme. It would become intolerable, and you wouldn't be doing any kind of a favor for a person by forcing him into this room. When living becomes intolerable, it is perhaps better not to begin. I think we all have a graphic mental picture of what overcrowding, overpopulation can mean. I don't agree with Professor Malloy that the conditions on Easter Island will repeat what occurred back in the 17th century. I think the Chilean government, Easter Island belongs to Chile, will come to its rescue before that and augment the food supply, which brings about the ratchet effect. When populations are not controlled by their own natural supply and demand, that is, when the population does not slow down when food is scarce, which it would normally do because of artificial or outside injections of food and supplies, the population growth does not slow down. Like the pole on the ratchet, it holds so that there is no reversal, and then once again moves up from that point. The last time I was in Puerto Rico, a truly beautiful place, I was aware of the pressure of the population. There are people everywhere, and every one of them seems to have a car traveling at top speed. Well, according to this same newsletter, the birth rate in Puerto Rico is higher than that of the United States, but its death rate is lower, believe it or not. In fact, we're in 40th place in the death rate. In 1973, the birth rate in Puerto Rico was 24.1 per 1,000, and the death rate was just 6.7 per 1,000, compared with the U.S. average of 15.6 and 9.4, respectively. By next year, it's estimated that approximately 60% of Puerto Rico's population will be under age 25, of which one-third will be less than 13 so conditions in Puerto Rico, which is already more crowded than India or Japan, would not seem to be getting any better. Speaking of the death rate, I don't think you'd ever guess the countries with the lowest death rates. I wouldn't have come close. They're Taiwan and Singapore, with only five deaths per 1,000 of population. The United States' death rate is 9.4 per 1,000 of population. And here's another surprise for you. Both Canada and Mexico beat the United States in the death rate, which is another way of saying their people are healthier than ours. Canada's is only 7.4, two full points better than the U.S. Mexico's is nine, and Mexico is one of the world's population problem countries. We were also beat out by such places as Singapore, Japan, Hong Kong, Fiji, Kuwait, Israel. Lebanon's is only five, one of the best on earth. Angola in Central Africa is worse, a death rate of 30 per 1,000 of population. You might be faintly surprised to learn that places like the Bahamas also beat the United States, as does Guadalupe, Jamaica, Martinique, Trinidad, and Tobago. 
The Netherlands Antilles is just six, well below ours, and Cuba also reports a figure of six per thousand. Almost makes you want to go live in the Caribbean, doesn't it? Beautiful climate, easy-going lifestyle, and very low death rate. Makes you think that maybe the death rate is affected by such things as climate and lifestyle, which it undoubtedly is. Cyprus beats us, too, as do Russia, Yugoslavia, Spain, Greece, and Albania. New Zealand and Australia beat us, too. But we beat Denmark, Ireland, Norway, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. England has a death rate of 12, quite high. My old friend Gary Wyron could tell us all about our poor showing in the death rate statistics. My guess would be that our relatively high death rate, 9.4, isn't high. It's just higher than 40-some other countries. And I don't know why we can't lead in that important department, too. My guess would be that there are two culprits at work here. One is easy living, not enough exercise, and the other would be poor diet and overeating. Millions upon millions of young Americans have been raised on a diet of soft drinks and french fries, and they're certainly not going to help us improve in the death rate statistics. In fact, our rate will probably worsen. When you have young mothers who, as teenagers, lived on french fries and soft drinks, you can't expect them to educate their own children on good nutritional habits. Add to that the fact that we don't walk anymore, that we tend to soften to death and develop physiques like polyethylene bags filled with chicken fat, and you can begin to understand why the richest country on earth is more than 40 places down the line when it comes to our mortality rate. I remember reading somewhere that Americans eat 97% more food than they require for good nutrition. It would appear that that sort of condition, while much to be desired, has much the same effect on mortality rates that a significant shortfall of food would have. William C. Paddock, a consultant in tropical agriculture, in a letter to the editor of the Washington Post in May of 74, wrote, Sooner or later, we must realize that we have already lost the race to balance food production and population growth. We thought we could win it during the last decade. From 1962 to 1972, the United States shipped $14 billion in food aid to Africa, Asia, and Latin America. This goodness on our part, justified by bureaucratic assurances that our government would somehow or other pressure these areas to produce more food and fewer children, has in no way minimized the threat of famine at the present time. In other words, the world is less able to cope with a food crisis today than it was before the massive outpouring of food aid. That's because of the ratchet effect I mentioned earlier. In a recent issue of Manus, October 16, 1974, Norman Podritz, the editor of Commentary, is quoted. He wrote, I believe that issues exist. It is an issue that our society still lives by success conceived in terms of status or money, and that the pursuit of success encourages the development of the worst human qualities and strangles the best. It is an issue that the curiosity of our children wastes away daily in the schools. It is an issue that work provides no satisfaction for the great majority of Americans, whether they sit at machines or behind desks. It is an issue that the air is filled with lies, that public speech has lost all connection with reality. It is an issue that everything we get costs too much. Too much money, too much energy, too much spirit. These are not issues that will be raised in any presidential election, but then so much the worse for presidential elections. Intellectuals do raise them from time to time, but in a mechanical way, as though they had trouble remembering what once burned fiercely in their souls a vision of what a decent human life on this earth might look like, and could only remember their bitterness at the refusal of others to share in the vision. Do intellectuals wish to change the world? Then let them work on the consciousness of the age and forget about parties and movements. Let them attend to their dreams of the good life and the good society, he writes, while others fret about pushing bills through Congress or winning votes in elections. Well, the editors of Manus say that this is an order of conviction which is immediately acceptable at one level of understanding, yet fades and is forgotten when we turn to so-called practical matters. How, after all, does one work on the consciousness of the age? How are changes in goals and objectives induced in human beings? The two ways we have of thinking about a decent human life on this earth are really poles apart, since the inner sense of enjoying meaning and having human fulfillment is not the direct result of effort towards some concrete achievement. It comes rather from a feeling nourished by undefinable existential currents. A change in consciousness is more a change in stance, in elevation, in perspective than in activity, although a change in activity often follows naturally from a change in stance. The effects of a change in consciousness are 
hardly predictable. The man who climbs to a high peak will see the entire landscape quite different in shape from what was visible at some lower altitude. All proportions and relationships alter. Things themselves do not change, but the new perception changes the observer's relation to them and therefore the value he puts upon them. Explaining this to others who still look at the world in the old way may seem practically impossible. Sometimes we can be impressed by the penetration of those who see the world from another's elevation yet remain unable to have the same perception. Freud once warned his followers that one poet's or philosopher's insight was worth more than a carload of sociologists and their camp followers. But neither he nor anyone else has explained how such insights can be translated into common understanding. Yet this was what Norman Podritz was in effect demanding. Not much else matters, he said, if there is no fundamental change in the way people view themselves and their life goals and undertakings. In what mysterious motivation do such changes originate? Why will one man in the midst of a struggle suddenly pause, shrug his shoulders, and say, it doesn't matter, and withdraw? And why will another, drifting through the motions of a mediocre career, one day seize the reins of decision and set out in an entirely different direction? We know little about such behavior, save that it happens, and that sometimes it has far-reaching results. Does the individual feel some sweeping reason to redefine success, removing it from the category of things externally measured to make it into an inward or private vision? Why should the ordinary pursuit of success encourage the worst and strangle the best in human beings? Not merely because success, as we commonly think of it, involves material rewards. It happens because we have a rigid standard for identifying successful achievement. Good human lives are filled with diversity. The decisions which shape them cannot be anticipated, except perhaps in their moral tone. A uniform definition of success rules out the differences among human beings. The abolition of difference puts an end to individuality, or more simply, to freedom. The matter has complexity, since people sometimes assert that freedom means the right to be the same as everyone else, to have what others have and do what they do. I guess one could say that most of what we've just said is brought about by that rigid standard for identifying successful achievement. When we think of success in this country, we think of the country club or the yacht club, of fine homes on shaded, well-cared-for avenues, of quiet, luxurious automobiles, foreign travel, leisure, fine clothes. It's this uniform definition of success that causes much of the problem. Ninety percent, perhaps ninety-nine percent of the people aren't going to live in that kind of setting. If they think that that represents success, and they're not going to be successful during their lives, nor are their kids. And that's a tough condition to contemplate when a person comes face to face with it. But with no attempt to sidestep the issue or candy coat an unpleasant pill, the conditions we've just described represent only one kind of success. Financial success. Now, since financial success, the ability to buy things we want and hire people to work for us and live in fine homes and not have to work for a living are all intimately connected with the ancient rights of kings and lords of various kinds and aristocrats who, even though they might be simpering morons, often held the power of life or death in their soft, delicate, and bejeweled hands, they're still attached to wealth, a myth of omnipotence, a sense of wonder and envy that persists even into this day of leveling taxation and the emergence of an affluent middle class. Perhaps 95% of the human beings on earth are poor, most of them desperately poor. This year, millions of human beings, just like you and me, will die of starvation. They're not concerned with making ends meet or paying their bills or managing to scrape enough money together to send a youngster to college. They're unable to obtain sufficient food to remain alive or keep their children alive. To such people, an American unemployed migrant worker is rich. One of the major concerns of our time, ranking with such problems as the survival of the human species, is how to provide a decent life for such people, regardless of where they're born or happen to live. A person shouldn't be condemned to die and watch his family die around him because of an accident of birth, because he happens to live in Chad or India or on an American Indian reservation or any place. A child is just as precious to such a mother or father. Life itself is just as dear. What is success to such a family? To any member of such a family? It's to have some productive land to till or a job and to earn enough to support the family and see the children grow in good health to adulthood. That's it. Just one sentence. And beginning there, any definition of success simply climbs Maslow's hierarchy of needs. 
It begins with the physical needs, air, water, food, shelter, and sleep, moves up to the propagational needs, sex, children, parental love, then to economy of effort, then to security, and then into the so-called meta-needs, self-esteem, social acceptance, love, belongingness, then to freedom, justice, order, purpose, achievement, then to such higher human needs as faith, beauty, goodness, truth, into the spiritual and aesthetic needs, and finally to happiness, and finally to self-actualization. Financial success doesn't mean that we will climb that ladder all the way to the top or even get close to the top. It might, but generally no. A person with a lot of money might seek any level on that chart, which we've printed for you in the text accompanying this tape cassette, but the fact that he has achieved financial success or inherited or whatever, while a nice condition to have achieved or be in possession of, does not indicate necessarily that... He's also achieved any of the meta-needs. It doesn't guarantee freedom or justice or order, nor, as the old cliché has it, happiness. A definition of success I've long felt comes very close to the mark is the one I used in my Stranger's Secret recording. Success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. It means that we are successful, and incidentally happiest, when we're moving towards something we want to bring about, especially when that something is worthy of us as persons, as members of the human race. I can conceive of a person working toward a worthy ideal and still being unhappy because of incidents or conditions in his life, the death of a loved one, the breaking up of his or her marriage, physical conditions, but it still holds together, I think, as a definition of success. It will apply to the starving as well as the most affluent. It will apply to people in every walk of life, to the young and the old. It has nothing to do with IQ or degree of education or place of birth. It simply means that the successful person is that person who has an ideal in his mind toward which he's moving. It doesn't mean he'll ever reach it. We are seldom completely satisfied with our work, whether it's a novel, a piece of music, or an end table. But in moving toward that ideal, whatever it is, we achieve a great deal. We achieve a sizable measure of our goal. Quite often we do reach it as the child moves toward completing his education, or we marry the person we want to marry or manage to reach the income we've set for ourselves. People with goals tend to achieve them. It's self-fulfilling prophecy, something we see about us every day of our lives. But the higher we reach on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the more difficult the achievement becomes. These achievements move into the realm of divergent problems, problems we simply live with and never truly solve in the sense that we can solve simpler problems. But that's good. We don't want to completely solve all of our problems, achieve completely all of our aspirations, then we'd have nothing more toward which to move and grow. As Candide tells us, we need to cultivate our garden. The need to work in a garden never ends. It is never complete, never finished. David McCord, the poet and essayist, in a commencement address at Colby College, Waterville, Maine, had something to say on how to make a good book really your own. He said, I've never forgotten the excitement of that moment when I learned how to make a book utterly my own, not yours or the next fellow's, but mine. Wherefore, today, some thousands of volumes, and many years later, I say to you, begin to build your personal library now. Not the family library, not a library of sets unopened, uncut, and unread, but an intimate library, a library as close to you as your clothes, your watch, or your car. In a few years' time, this alter ego collection will number 50 or 100 or several hundred volumes, totally a part of you. Great books, said E.M. Forster, make you feel small in the right way. And if each book is truly a great or influential book, tested by years or generations or centuries of other readers, a great or influential book germane to you and to your need because you read it with delight, like Moby Dick or My Antonia or The Outermost House, A Passage to India, Walden, Arabia Deserta, The Tempest, Hamlet, Pierre Gint, Samson, Agonistes, The Heart of Emerson's Journals, Pickwick, Alice, The Sea in the Jungle, Father and Son, The Oregon Trail, Kim, Far Away and Long Ago, Equanimitas, Life on the Mississippi, Of Human Bondage, Talk of the Otter, The Small Years, The Mirror of the Sea, War and Peace, Religio Medici, The Practical Cogitator, The Crock of Gold, The Country of the Pointed Furs, Cobbers, Come Hither, The Dyer's Hand, The Castle, or The Road to Xanadu, well, then I say, your correspondence, your papers, reports, articles, recommendations, everything you write will reflect possession of this body of knowledge, pursuit of style, and effortless reference. The book of quotations has not been made that will hold a candle to what you carry in your head as far as you're concerned. 
for what you will carry in your head will be the flavor of good writing. Your everyday speech will have taken on a hue and a quality above that of your friends and colleagues. Now, I'm not talking miracles. I'm talking facts. For example, as your daily intake of mail increases over a decade and you will wish it would not, you will find, as I have found, that it is a lucky morning when one unfolded letter rests on the top of the pile because it is flawless in composition, correct in punctuation, original in voice, engaging in tone, compelling by enthusiasm, yet dismaying in the thought that you have not the wit to answer it in kind. But when you have answered it, have cheerfully sweated over every paragraph, you will be cheerfully surprised to discover that reading with a pencil has taught you the truth of what Mark Twain observed somewhat ahead of us. The difference between the right word and the nearly right word is the difference between lightning and lightning bug. Dr. Robert B. Greeno, the cancer surgeon, once received the perfect bread and butter letter after a house party he'd given on Cape Cod. Dear Bob, wrote Mr. C.F. Weed, a graduate of Trinity College. Some parties deserve a letter, some don't. Yours does, here's mine. Well, these are the right words. They're not rude words, and not one of them can be deleted. Right words also are these from another source. If ever I can do anything to help you, hesitate to ask me. One thing more. I advocate what Professor Reuben Brower of Harvard proposes in a book called In Defense of Reading. Slow down the process of reading to observe what's happening to the words, their uses, and their meanings. Speed reading, useful to an editor, a scholar, in search of something in particular, has no more place in your cultural growth than a book club. Slow down. Read the way a poet does, to taste, to reflect, and to savor. Hunt the second-hand bookstores and zero in on the right books for you the way we used to align a bee tree out in Oregon by triangulation. When several critics are friends with a trusted background of learning, say at different times, you've never read Erskine Childers' The Riddle of the Sands? Well, go out and find it. I'm no sailor of small boats, but that's precisely how I came upon the Riddle of the Sands, as you may also, a breathtaking adventure with this classic in its field. Be not otitious living on one book. Be alert in your diversity. At the beginning of his essay, David McCord writes, Many of you have surely noticed in your reading in the past few months an increasing use of the word autodidact. Without going to the dictionary, where you may not find it anyway, you can guess that it means a person self-teaching or self-taught. Now, Lincoln, Darwin, Edison, Bell, Burbank, Franklin, Whitman, Edward Lear, Winslow Homer, Mark Twain, Henry Ford, and Ernest Hemingway were autodidacts. Not one of them went to college. Of course, it's the function of our schools, our colleges, and universities to teach us to be autodidacts. But the tragedy is that most of the learning process, as we learned it, dies with a diploma. You may pursue this dismal thought somewhere in Jowett, introducing Plato. He wrote, the want of energy is one of the main reasons why so few persons continue to improve in later years. They have not this will and do not know the way. They never try an experiment or look up a point of interest for themselves. They make no sacrifices for the sake of knowledge. Hardly anyone keeps up his interest in knowledge throughout a whole life. The most appalling phase of this indictment is, of course, the class indifference of the average U.S. citizen toward the English language, the speaking, reading, and writing of the richest, most sonorous, poetic, searching, and rewarding of all tongues west of Babel, Shakespeare's universal language, the one language which circles the globe, the one language which people born in France, Germany, Holland, Denmark, China, Japan, Brazil, and India, as I have heard them, often handle with a grace, command, and reverence enough to shame us. My friend Zhang Yi, the self-styled silent traveler, for example, or Vladimir Nabokov, or Professor Kozo Tada of the University of Tokyo, of the late Isaac Dennison of Denmark, one of the great stylists of our time whose voice I've heard on records. I do not ask why this is so, but I do ask why the self-teaching instinct in us, so strong when we're learning to play baseball, collect stamps, skin dive, ski, or reassemble a gasoline engine, fails to focus in our riper years on what can give delight and distinction and explicit power to our speech, our writing, our reading, and so infinitely more important, to the art and spiritual enjoyment of living, which means you and me. Or wanting for this, just why the autodidact in us fails to focus on our language as a simple tool, the mastery of which has proved itself for centuries an asset beyond price in business, industry, the professions. In marriage, parenthood, and in the daily commerce and noble merchantry, as John Buchan said, of our so-called civilization. The autodidact in the poet does not fail him. 
great poetry, good poetry, is free of jargon. Poets know, as Emerson said, that every word was once a poem. They read aloud to themselves. They hear as well as see. They have an ear for tone and overtone, else they are not poets. They flush the cuckoo adjective out of the nest of nouns and verbs. They seek exactness out of inexactness. They hear their own echoes, all words disastrously repeated, and eliminate them. They loathe and avoid the cliché. No problem. That's the way the ball bounces. Let's face it. Get with it. That's what you think. You can say that again. As a matter of fact, no kidding. Let me put it this way. They choose the muscular metaphor above the weaker simile. Something is, not something is like. Up from India glances the silver sail of dawn, which is houseman. The smell of liver and bacon sidled into the street with onions on its breath, which is Dylan Thomas. Poets are masters of precision, the précis. Every poet worth his salt gets the essential shiver down the backbone at sight or sound of the inevitable distilled in the alembic. I have seen old ships sail like swans asleep beyond the village which men still call Tyre. When I was an undergraduate, uneasy in determination to become a physicist, I took very lightly the solemn counsel of Professor Charles T. Copeland, Copy of Calais, Maine, that reading poetry and trying one's hand with poetry was the best and for many people the only way to learn to write responsible, respectable, persuasive prose. By the time I reached the graduate school and was listening to Professor John Livingston Lowe's at the peak of his power in that vast and thrilling study of Coleridge, which he subsequently called The Road to Xanadu, I knew that Copey was right. But if poetry was important, so was poetic prose itself. Professor Lowe's was a stylist with a powerful sense of drama and detection. It was this five-foot giant with a booming voice and occasional outbursts of choleric temper who urged upon us the art of reading with a pencil, not to disfigure a book with schoolboy underscoring, a book, of course, for which we had paid good money, but to put a small vertical line in the margin opposite the significant sentence, word, or paragraph, and to write on a blank page at the back, the folio, or whatever, quote the word, phrase, or sentence in question, make a note of our dissent if we differed, or a comparison with, or a parallel to something else if we had a comparison or a parallel available, or an extension of an idea, if we could extend it, a page or two of such notes, and the heart of the volume is yours forever. And that's how David Bacord suggests you learn to make a book completely your own. Write a page or two of notes on the book, and you have the heart of it. And I think we should remember his admonition, if we're not already well on our way, to start that personal library now, not the family library, not a library of sets unopened, uncut, and unread, but an intimate library, a library as close to you as your clothes. Thank you.